The following is a conversation with Monica Perez from the Propaganda Report. What I'm going to be doing here, guys, is I'm going to be trying every Friday to uh, release a new uh, interview segment where we bring people from all walks of life all over the world. We talk with them, slash interview them, get their perspectives, you name it. Monica is a very nice person, one of the nicest people I know. Uh, She runs the Propaganda Report uh, along with her partner, and I would recommend you check that out 100%. I do want to say just because Monica will be putting this up on her end. Uh, I have Instagram, Generation Z Podcast. You can email me, genzpodcast at gmail.com or patreon.com slash generation Z um, or at podcast Z on Twitter as well too. Now, before I start the interview, I just want to say the goal here, guys, as always with this show, is not to try to enforce certain views or anything like this onto you. It is simply to broaden your perspective, even if you might not agree with her or you might not agree with me. Right. And the goal here is to not say, well, you know, this happened and that happened. The goal here is to just absorb and maybe see if some of our perspectives could be altered or added to or in some cases subtracted from if they, metaphorically, if that makes sense. Right. So, again, we're going to be trying this segment out. Let me know what you think and uh, enjoy. Thank you very much. My, my sister calls it. TLM, think like Monica. <laughs> so I always think, well, it's easy, but right, it's right. also a little cynical. But every time I don't think that way, every time I think, well, maybe this is just what you see is what you get, I end up with egg on my face because <laughs> it's never, it's right. never what you see is what you get. Never. And if it is, then you have to sort through the the whitewash cover up. So like ninety percent of the time it's complete BS, and ten percent of the time it's it's a it's a true story that's being spun. So would you would you say it's um um uh, what they call like a fake burger? So like the the meat part of the burger is true, but the rest is all BS on top of it. And below? it can be either. So what Binkley, my partner and co-host, says he says like your classic propaganda is one lie sandwiched between two truths. Mm. So ninety percent of it is that maybe, but ten right. percent of it is the opposite. It's one truth sandwiched between two lies so right. that you can't see the truth. So you'll, they'll say 9-11 is like laser beams from outer space or right. whatever. And then you'll say, well, I don't believe any of the questions about 9-11 because those people are crazy. Oh, I see what you're saying. So yeah, yeah. so I, I invented a term for the for people who are out there messing up the truth and I and it's kind of vulgar but it's funny the taint <laughs> agents so they're taint right. agents they taint the truth with these things that sound crazy like Alex Jones I've known people who have known him and they're right. like he's completely what you see is what you get right. so maybe he is however he acts as a taint agent either he's getting information from the wrong people but like my famous example is he was on Piers Morgan Right. After the after the school shooting that caused him so much trouble. Yes. And one week, Piers Morgan had the gun owners of America guy on Larry Pratt, who yes. made a very clear, compelling argument in favor of gun ownership. Yeah. And then as if to negate that, they then had Alex Jones on, who was like jumping up and down and right. made it seem like right you don't want that guy having a gun so i so, but i think he was i i think it's like a book i read conjuring hitler where they said they actually just looked around in all the post-world war one activists and found the one who would do what they wanted which was kind of destroy the culture without destroying the banking system for example right so right. I don't think these people are all aware. I just think that gotcha. they serve their purpose and they wouldn't be promoted if they didn't. But Right. So I, I did want to ask uh, that now that you brought up Alex Jones, um, people like him, uh, not to specifically use him as an example, but people like him. Do you subscribe to the possibility that once a certain self-proclaimed you know truth seeker like Alex Jones once was or I guess still is hits a certain point, they become controlled opposition? Do you think? I think there's virtually no hope for an organization or an individual to really hit critical mass and 
and be pure and do good. I mean, there are people I could name who I think are kind of huge and legit, like James Corbett. I just, I think that he's totally right. huge and totally legit. I've seen him interact with people over the years. I've been following him since, I mean, I'm probably the first person I know who was following him. And yeah. over the years, you could see him interact with people who didn't always stand up to that kind of scrutiny. Right. But he, in my opinion, does. Now, how much impact does he have outside of the circle of people who are already kind of convinced? I don't know. Mm. But if you, I do think if you start reaching people in the, the mainstream, right. they, they would kill you if they had to. Got you, got you. So when you see, for example, in the case of like um, people who are now starting their own websites because of the censoring on, on YouTube and all that, do you see a, a website as the kind of the way out or do you see that they could still hammer down on you if they really, really, you know, push? Well, that's what that's what I'm doing, actually. Right. I mean, right. not in any kind of like this is the answer way, but just I've right. been deplatformed and I'm really not good at that. Although I could, I could crack the code on how to like work the buddy press and all I, I did. WordPress was so easy and I had seven years of work on there. And I right. had, I mean, I had would upload, I would upload like videos to my computer and then upload it to my site. So those are still preserved, but, but I just had so much material that eventually it was just links and stuff. Right. Well, WordPress took me down. They gave me my like um, letters, you know, they gave me the text, but everything was dead. And it's been a couple of years and I never really recovered because who has the time, right. but I now have somebody who's helping me and, and everything I really need to do, he can help me do. Mm -hmm. But again, it's kind of like Corbett when he left Twitter, I I'm no Corbett, but I do have, I just looked, I didn't even know how to find the emails of people who signed up for my newsletter. Cause I was just co totally overwhelmed. And yeah. I just, this second, one second ago found them and there's like a thousand email addresses there. And yeah. then I have like hundreds and hundreds on Patreon and hundreds and hundreds on Rockfin. So I now have thousands of people who really want to hear what Brad and I have to say. Right. So I can reach them now, but how, but I couldn't start that way. And then there's also that other problem. I used to be on terrestrial radio and I could open people's eyes to stuff. Really, I could just find stuff buried in the mainstream media that had a lot of credibility to people who listen to the mainstream media. But right. I'd find a New York Times article about the FBI hatching F, uh, terrorist plots, or I'd find this courts article on how the NSA started Google and why. And you could you could reach people who were like, wow. And then they would look it up and verify it. And I can't do that anymore. And I've read before how that uh, researchers who wrote books that the publisher said, hey man, this is national security, whatever, we had to run it by the government and they want you to take this stuff out. You can write two separate books, one that has this and one that, but you're not allowed to connect those dots in the same book. And uh -oh. I, so that kind of thing made me think that the silo effect is very, very powerful. As a matter of fact, they like us in here creating little cells of, of isolated silo information because then they can say, everybody knows a crazy person and we need to censor Facebook because look, you know, oh my gosh, like, oh, the Monica Perez people. And, and then they get that. They, and it, they and get then it that. becomes, sorry, it becomes like an echo chamber. It's an echo chamber and it's a label, you know, and I, and, and I, I don't care, but it's just the only hope now I have. So I had to like try to understand what I was doing and why, because what we do, what Binkley and I do is we just read the mainstream media every day and we just try to pull back the curtain. Right. And for, for people who are truly woke, not in the new sense, but like who really don't have scales on their eyes anymore. I think this may be a trap also, but I think most of those people are trying to figure out how to raise chickens right. or grow tomatoes. Like, they're just like, I don't care about the news anymore. What do, I don't need to vote because it's bull. And even if it were fair by then you would have only selected candidates, like I'm out. Right. And I thought that too. I was like, what, even when they asked me to go on the radio, I was kind of discovered. I thought, what's the point? Like, I, I don't think you can have a coercive monopoly government and liberty. So I don't. And then I, 
had to come to terms with the Bill of Rights is important and let's kick the can on that. Like, I don't need to blow up this government, even though it's corrupt, as long as I can, we can fight for those liberties. And then, so for my, the show that I do now, the reason we're doing it, I kind of distilled is that a lot of us live in the world, have to go to work, our kids go to school, even the private schools, and they come home with a lot of propaganda in their heads, both like factual stuff, like the um, like the vaccines have been approved. The vaccines have not been approved. They've been emergency authorized. That's a very different thing. So that's propaganda of like the facts, but they also get propaganda of ideology. Like what is socialism? What is capitalism? Wow, sorry, I, I didn't, I, you just blew my mind. I didn't know that the difference between approved and then emergency authorized. Right, They or if, it's, if you're giving someone a drug that isn't authorized, you can get into big trouble. As a matter of fact, you're not even allowed to say things that, the FDA hasn't approved, even if it's true like that. Oh, so by authorizing it in the case of an emergency, you're just giving someone the authority to give it out. It has not gone through the regulatory approval process, which takes years and implies a certain level of safety and efficacy, a certain length of trial. It's, you know, it's years where they see how people have responded over time. That has not happened. Wow. So speaking of, of pro propaganda, first off, that blew my mind. Thank you, first off. But <laughs> the, the, what I wanted to transition into was um, having to do with propaganda, specifically with the CIA. And uh, I do want to focus on one thing in particular and then get your opinion on an individual. So the whole Russia thing. Now, I'm not trying to defend Russia, but I also want to say, say that we have to, you know, play it down the middle and be fair, right? So there are a lot of people saying that are being censored now that, for example, the CIA, as reported by the mainstream media and even, you know, like um, the Young Turks, like very left leaning and what have you, um, the CIA has their own sources, two or three sources. They said, obviously, because their sources, they can't give them up, but their sources told them that uh, Trump was directly colluding with Putin. Whereas when we look at the, the irony in that, we have Julian Assange, who's literally being mentally tortured to death, literally, because he will not give up his sources. So how much of this do you think is CIA propaganda for the betterment of America? Uh, versus the world. And then I want to get your take on uh, former director John Brennan, but I'll. I'll... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I think. I think that the people at the top, the CIA or whatever, I, I, I actually was reading a book recently and the little quote in the very beginning of the book said, we do the exact same. This is from the forties. I think we do the exact same thing that everybody, every other country does, but we just do it for the right reasons. And I don't actually believe that's possible. I think that that's the, that's the essence of kind of American exceptionalism. We're the exception to the rules of morality and sovereignty because we are good and we can be trusted. And that's, that may be true the first generation but it's not, not, it cannot sustain that way because then your evil people are going to go hijack that thing. And I think it goes to the essence of morality and what morality really is. It's one of two things. It's either 10,000 years of human civilization have generated these norms that allow you to to feel a sense of you know, I guess it's, it's a kind of stability. It's a kind of, it's kind of like love as insurance. So you're right. married and yeah. you don't know who's going to get sick first. Got so it. you'd better make it pretty clear. I'm going to be there for you, honey. I don't care what <laughs> happens to you because right. you want them to be there for you. Right. And right. it's the same thing about just society in general. I just feel like the laws, moral laws are really practical laws. And so the pragmatism is in the principle or, or moral laws come down from God based on our true nature. But I always try to emphasize that the pragmatism is the principle. The principle is pragmatic. Gotcha. These laws are there because they make sense over time. So when people start saying there are exceptions to that law, I think that's them kidding themselves. And I think it's very elitist. And I think they have contempt for the regular people, including for 
democracy in general. And I think they recognize that democracy is the opiate of the masses, that democracy is the thing that gets people to go along because they think they're being represented. And, and so I think that's what the CIA is doing. So if you, if you overlay that onto the Russia thing, I think they will say and do anything they feel they need to in order to Create get the enemy. outcome they want. Right. And also keep an enemy external, uh, externally, like keep uh, an external enemy. And an internal enemy, too. I think they have right. to have this despised minority within the U.S. because that's the thing. That's why I keep referring to this 60s document, which maybe was real, maybe was, wasn't, but it's the report from Iron Mountain where it makes it clear that the hierarchy needs the people. So it's the consent of the governed idea from Etienne de la Boati from way back when right. yeah. that the consent of the people is essential for a government to function and how do you get that consent and it's basically fear so if you can't get them to fear the outside because you have nuclear weapons and no one else does and that just does away with all fear gotcha. in the u.s then you have to have the fear from within you have to have drug addicts or criminals like you and it actually lays it out like you have to have fear so now i feel like the fear is the pandemic but i feel like we've gone completely over to the pathocracy where it's not for us at all the the guys at the top convince themselves that they are doing it for us but they're really just in those positions because they're the guys who respect the authority inherently. It's like I heard about Skull and Bones and in Yale that yeah. they don't choose the people because they're the leaders. They choose the people because they're the followers almost. They're, they're, the, they're, they're willing to work on the team no matter what. Oh, like putting morals aside, putting ethics aside, everything. And even thinking. Gotcha. Yeah, they put everything aside. So they pick 15 seniors a year to be in Skull and Bones, and it's not the thought leaders. Huh. Interesting. I, you what, know what? I, I always perceive Skull and Bones to be sort of like just a, uh, you know, the, the group, the sons and daughters of the elite, so to speak, and what have you. It's interesting because, it, like you said, it could be that, but uh, sorry, you were going to say? Yeah, I just, I don't think it's always that. Like Jeb wasn't one, but George W. was one. And huh. Jeb seems like a guy, if you ever see him behind the scenes, think I think he's got a little more savvy. <laughs> and so he's not, he's not your guy because he could mess it up. Of course they can't put everybody in, but like I would never have been chosen in a million trillion years. Right. I mean, never, even if I was the cleverest one of the bunch. Got you. So speaking of, of cleverest of the, of the bunch, um, the reason why I want to ask about former CIA director Brennan is because I, um, I want to get your opinion on or your perspective on towing the fine line between defining like, you know, the word deep state and these people that are involved in it. Like, you know, Brennan's allegedly part of he's in theory, one would say he would be, you know, a member of the deep state, so to speak. But I want to get your perspective on a guy like uh, a Brennan in terms of just overall ruthlessness, morals, things like this, because let's be honest, the Mossad, MI6, CIA, they do, I mean, for example, there was a, a Reddit Q&A with an ex-CIA agent, and he was asked on Reddit, does the CIA or any other intelligence agency ever use, for example, uh, child prostitution as a form of blackmail? And the agent then responded, he goes, I'm going to plead the fifth on that. He goes, but all I will say about this, and he's a confirmed CIA, like Reddit confirmed him, right. verified all that. And he said, he goes, all I'm, he goes, the reason why I'm pleading the fifth is because he goes, we may or may not do things that are worse than that, that kept me up at night. But he goes, I'm pleading the fifth. So when you look at those things, do you see a guy like John Brennan as someone who's smart but for the wrong reasons and like you just said about skull and bones he knows how to follow the orders no matter what or i i think the people you see the people who are in front of the camera i think they've gotten to the point where they they can never actually really be that smart because i look at jfk reagan nixon all those guys i think were like I don't, I don't know if you, we can call them deep state, but like they were all insiders. Like they yes. knew yes. these guys. So why did you have to kill them? Or in Nixon's case, take them out in a coup? Why did you have to do that? Well, because 
they were also real men, you know, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they weren't gonna, they were like, I'm the president now. So I get to call some of the shots and I'm not doing something unconscionable or I have a different goal from yours. Right. And that's when they got to go. So I think that when you got to somebody like they say, Jimmy Carter was picked by Brzezinski as having, and this is surprising to me, but his story was that he had so much of an ego. And I think maybe Obama was like that. They say this about Woodrow Wilson, that he's, they, they have such an ego that they, they can't imagine being kind of tricked or deceived or stovepiped. Right. Um, that they they are easy to deceive. But then I look at somebody like Bill Clinton, and I think that he was so, not Machiavellian, but like without a conscience that he just knew what he wanted. He did not care at all. He was so, he could lie so well. I mean- And you, if, I, you, if I could yeah. say, sorry, yeah. if I could just yeah, say, that's... It, tell me if I'm wrong, because unfortunately I was just born right when he kind of, <laughs> his term was ending. So I, I always saw from the footage, but I also heard he had a certain, I guess we could call swagger about him that kind of let everyone's defense, like their moral and ethical defenses down. Is that true? He had that I, personality. I, that's probably true. I hadn't thought about it in terms of moral defenses, but I will say over the years, I've met many people, a few who met him and a few who've met other people like John Edwards and George W. Bush even, right. and what they would say about these guys. And I'm not sure, I don't think it was star power that was like clouding their vision. They were saying to me, these are intelligent people were saying to me, you don't understand. Like George W. Bush is so much smarter than you think. Or um, John Edwards, I don't, you probably don't remember this, but John Edwards is a piece of crap. And, uh, and Bill Clinton was like that too. And people would say, you don't understand what a warm, caring person he is. And I feel like the way Hollywood has that star power. Like you're not Brad, like I've lived in LA before I've been around Hollywood. Like you'll find waiters and waitresses who are like the most beautiful people you ever saw, like weird, transcendentally beautiful. And you're like, this is cause it's Hollywood. And that person can be a star. You just don't see that every day. Right. And, and I feel like that's how it works in politics is that if they have that rare quality, so rare as a matter of fact, that I think they have actually sometimes find those people as teenagers. I think they found Fidel Castro as a teenager. I think they found James Comey as a teenager. Um, and then now they have kind of the teenager um, uh, pool to, to, so like where Stacey Abrams went to the Telluride program, which is a, a thing. Zuckerberg, Lady Gaga, Sergey Brin, the guy who runs Quora, they all went to the Center for Talented Youth at Johns Hopkins. I think they were like middle schoolers when they went there in the summer. But I think they they have those kind of incubators or even just like vetting pools. Yeah. And I, I so I think they start these people pretty young. And then Bill Clinton was a Rhodes Scholar, for example. Like that's a perfect Rachel Maddow was a Rhodes Scholar. As soon as I hear Rhodes Scholar, I'm a little <laughs> it's up there with skull and bones, if you ask me. R right, absolutely. So it's interesting you say that because it's like they're they're grooming them and then they kind of filter through to see okay, who will who will go to the, the private sector side, who will, you know, get onto the politics side. Yes, right? I've actually seen that. I saw that now that you mention it, I saw there was a an internship program that a friend of mine got into and it had silos like that and it was like mm. academia the press politics um that's very interesting yeah so they do that but i always think of it as there's two other filters one is who can make it so i see britney spears when she shaved her head it's like mm. Oh, she did she <laughs> her programming broke or whatever right and then and then you have you have people who like, um, what is his name? I always get his name wrong. Uh, Fitzpatrick, Kwambe Fitzpatrick, something like that. Oh, he was Detroit um, mayor. Yes. Yes. Right. But so he didn't, it didn't work out with him, but it did work out for Obama. So you just, you just have, I think they have a lot of people who either sink or swim. It works or it doesn't work. You have to have somebody who's a little bit, um, open to being immoral because you need them to be immoral and you need, you know, because they're going to do stuff for you that like people with morals wouldn't do. And you need them to have 
skeletons in their closet that you can control them with the threat of scandal. And then I think at a certain level, they do let the people decide. Like, I really think they let the people decide between Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. Like, I really think that was a choice. And I think that if, if, if the people wanted Hillary, I think they would have let the people get Hillary. But I think Trump was the one who the people wanted and there was plenty he could do. And now Biden will do what, you know, what Hillary would have wanted to do. And maybe, you know, he's starting at a point of higher deficits and fewer freedoms. So he's going to actually move the ball further than Hillary could have if she had been in there before Trump. Thank you for bringing that up because I wanted to ask about your your perspective on Hillary. I know that's probably a bit of a a vague question because there's so much you could delve into probably, (laughs) but (laughs) yeah, I figured figured as much. But what do you think? Like, I mean, it's pretty well known on both sides. She's a a neocon, so to speak. It seems to be, and you may know this actually far better than I do. It seems to be that even on the left nowadays, in terms of political commentary or reporting, uh, more so independent reporting, it seems like like even if you move too far left, the mainstream media gets pissed off because in theory, there's a lot of proposals that could technically work far left and more, you know, center conservative, center right, that the media just kind of says, no, 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 don't worry about it. Like, let's not look at that. So do you see, like, you see Hillary as, as the, the brains behind bill, if she had gotten in, what do you think would have occurred under her just more advancement of like the, the neocon type structure or. Yeah, that's interesting. I do. They absolutely are neocons They're The welfare warfare super state is Mm -hmm. fostered and promoted by both sides. The left promises the goodies. So they probably get a little more than 50% of the vote. The right doesn't want fit, doesn't want to win because they they like to cut their deals, which requires a lot of big spending, but they can't take the heat for that. So I don't right. think they like being in the majority. I think with Bill and Hillary, I think it's uh, there. They are. I think they kind of walk that line of the what I was saying before about JFK, Nixon and Reagan, like they wanted right. their power, but they were I do believe that they were more um like uh, petty or greedy or whatever, like it wasn't this megalomania, like I need to go down in the history books. I don't get that sense. So you could control them a little more easily. I don't think she was necessarily the brains behind Bill any more than uh, Michelle was the brains behind Obama. Like she was a more successful lawyer than her husband, the both of those women were, I think, if I understand correctly. But they, the, This is where my, you know, I think that those, that's where I'm not sure. And of course, like uh, Corbett, I was on Corbett once, which was very fun. And he, I said something about 3D chess, which he used to say back in the day, but he won't say it anymore because now it's like a Q thing. But I still, it's such a great, you know, I hate to give up that visual. Right. It's where you're going to level up from the Republican Democrat thing to like a higher level of power that's operates on a different plane. And then there's like at least one more above that, if not two. So it's where like the Hillary thing comes in that clearly she's doing what neocons do, but is she doing it for the same people or is there a kind of left right tension? Like, I feel like they were really heavily involved in exploiting Ukraine. And then Giuliani came in and he wanted a piece of the action and it didn't really work out because he really isn't as good at that (laughs) as they are. They're not gonna share it with him. There is some real tension there, but ultimately there there's, you know, it's the IMF, it's the World Bank. It's something, it's a bigger game. But what I feel like, and you said something that not too many people really can, will say, which is, the I, I believe you didn't say this, but I, I think you'll understand what I'm saying. That the ideology we have the technology now that any ideology, any mainstream, it's like religion. There's like three or four, whatever big, big religions. They all have basic morality: don't kill and don't steal, and a right. bunch of other stuff. But right. like the Satanism, Luciferianism, isn't a mainstream religion. It has totally different morals, but all the really big mor- religions have like a couple of basic moral tenets that they all kind of agree on. Right. And yeah. and, and I feel like of the of that level ideology is like I always say it's Plato versus Aristotle. Plato would say what's good for society is what 
is where you have to like make your decisions. And I think Aristotle would say what's good for the individual is where you have to make your decisions. I go with the Aristotle thing and I say that in itself stabilizes society, creates for a more moral society because people do ultimately understand what's in their own best interest. Don't cheat on your wife if you don't want her to cheat on you kind of thing. Not yeah, everybody exactly. goes for that, but you, right. it's in your power. And the thing with Aristotle is if you impart the morality to the person, kind of like a guilt versus shame thing, if you right. make them feel personally responsible and you hold them to it, which is why God comes in handy there, then they, it's like the consent of the governed. They are going to enforce the laws without like all this apparatus, without all this judgment, whereas the Platonic way where you have to do what's good for society, it's hard for a person to internalize that or even know it. So then you need philosopher kings, you need to think about it, you need to take the kids away from the parents and you have to enforce all that, that's kind of tricky. But those are the basic two ideologies, I think. So you got socialism and you have free markets, let's say. Gotcha. And, and I think that at this level of technology, even with 7 billion people in the world, either of those, if expedited in a good faith way would work. We wouldn't have poverty or whatever. Like we could just do what we wanted. Like Sweden, they, eh, so they, they, their wine isn't as good. You know, the rich people don't, there are not many people who get to drink the really good wine, but they get to right. drink wine. And all you really want is, you know, even, <laughs> even the USSR had sex and vodka. Like that's all you really need. <laughs> so, so you could do it, but the problem is I feel like we're in a post ideological world in that, it does, the ideology doesn't, the ideology is that opiate of the masses. If, if I could just say quickly, I just wanted to add quickly to what you're saying. When you say post ideology, would you also be possibly, and please tell me if I'm wrong, would you also be referring to the fact that a lot of people, not just in the West, but around the world as well, are more engaged in culture wars instead of real ideologies? That's a great point. And I hadn't drawn that co co uh, connection. I was just thinking that it's so corrupt. They just use ideology to fool us. Mm -hmm. But but what you're saying, and we should probably try to tease that out, is that they've replaced ideology with identity. Like Trump finally brought identity politics to the right, whereas Ron Paul before him was tapping into the same energy on the right, but he was doing it by uh, engaging on the ideological level, by appealing to people's innate morality and their sense of history rather than culture, their sense of the true American experiment, which was not really meant to be cultural. It was, I mean, you could argue that, but right. it was really meant, it was like an enlightenment thing. It was a rationality thing. It was a, it was a dollars and cents thing. It was, you know, math <laughs> and that's right. what it yeah. was. And, and it created a culture, a culture of autonomy and, and although not sophisticated in a cultural sense, sophisticated as an actor. And so like Ron Paul's ideology is more sophisticated than Trump's. And I used to think that the libertarian thing was just black and white, but it, it's like Catholicism for me. Like it just, it, you get, you know, not that I'm yeah. like yeah. A, such a great Catholic, but I'm a Catholic. And if you have real moral questions, you are going to be able to find someone who wrote a treatise on it. You don't have to agree with Thomas Aquinas or whatever, but when you read it, you're, you are going to walk away with a better understanding of the question that you went into it with. That's true. If you go to Mises.com or dot or whatever it is, or listen to Ron Paul, you are going to understand better why you don't really understand limited liability corporations, why it makes sense or not, what's the moral answer. But when you dig into Trump, you're never, ever getting that. But you are getting, and so it's kind of that cultural Marxism, that Frankfurt School stuff, but on the right now, because it, yeah. and if you look at where the cultural Marxism Frankfurt School stuff came from, it came from the fact that the economic thing was not going to get people to betray their uh, nationality. They really right. thought of their nationality, their language, which was almost always coincidental with religion, with the family, with their roots, with how you make a living, with your, with the weather is connected to your farmland and the mm. seeds and the food that you eat. They were trying to get the workers of the world to unite and they absolutely could not. Yeah. So I think they tried to get an identity going that was divisive. 
So yeah. maybe you could look at like the Sykes Pico and say they went in there and they made Frankenstein countries on purpose so that that tribal thing was not going to be powerful. And now that 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 finally from Nasser to even Assad, that started to get uh, they started to be able to digest that and then make a secular state that was going to be a problem. So now they're reverting to, you know, I think the world powers are trying to get that tribalism going again. Yes. Um, and they, I, I, you know. Yeah. No, I just wanted to say, because when you look at that, too, it's 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 interesting that, I mean, it's almost as if, and I say this carefully because I don't know the, all the facts behind it, but you look at Putin backing Assad and it's possible Putin saw that as an opportunity because he knows how the U.S. is, right, in terms of like how you said, I think you nailed it on the head, they're um, what's retreating back, the, the Western powers that be are retreating back, but um, what I did want to transition to because you brought up um, religion and, and values and things like that was, um, was Israel, um, I wanted to ask, get your perspective on the influence Israel has within the West. Um, I guess I, I guess we could argue Canada as well, but um, the the reason why I ask that is because obviously there's the whole thing of like uh, you know the xenophobia and the racism and all that, but I'm not asking about that. More so about just that everyone knows that the Jewish people tend to stick together, whether people like it or not. They're largely you know uh, intellectual, and then at the higher echelon levels, there's you know the Mossad and you know uh, Israel's alleged infiltration of Hollywood and you know things like this, uh, Epstein with the blackmailing and all that. So I wanted to know, do you think there are certain factions within America that are controlled by um, countries such as Israel? Because I could be totally wrong here, but when I look at countries like uh, Russia or Israel, I see more of a top-down kind of like, there are some figures pulling the strings, but the one at the top has the final say. Whereas in America, at least when I look at Biden right now, I see him being pulled by the strings in every direction. You know what I mean? Yes, or I do know what you mean. And I actually, there's two ways I want to answer that. And I think sure, you're right yeah. about the top down thing, because I'd actually written while you were talking about that. I think that those influences that you're talking about are highly individualistic. And an example of why is I think Israel is the most vaccinated population on the planet right now. Right now they are. So, yeah. Yeah. So if, if Netanyahu's your dad and and that those vaccines are not approved, but merely authorized. Is your dad going to shoot you up with that stuff? Or is he going to be like, whatever, I'm, I'm playing, I'm playing my game here. Right. You know, like, I, I feel like it, it is more of an individual thing and, and not, um, there could be some of that going on where you attribute to the whole country or whole people, what individuals are doing for their own purposes. And that folds into the other answer that I would give you is, I read a book that was it um it was called An Introduction to the Israel Palestine Conflict by Gregory Harms. And I just really I was on that on the radio and um this was, you know, I, I was started on the radio 10 years ago. The Middle Eastern stuff was like very important. And I'm not really an I'm definitely not a neocon, I'm anti-war. I really wanted to understand what was going on there and how to analyze it. And I got this Israeli-Palestinian conflict thing and I definitely thought it would be more two-sided, but um, there were some like disturbing things about how the the settlers, uh, there were people who had like title to the land who could not return to their land, oh, stuff sorry, like that. Like the, the 67 border conflict? Yeah, it was, yeah. it was that kind of stuff. And it was disturbing. I did not, you know, I was unhappy with that because I don't, I, I don't like, conflict. I'm from New York. My you know, really good <laughs> friends are Jewish and really care about Israel is like they because they feel personally threatened by the world. They feel like they need a place that's safe. And I just I didn't like it at all. Right. And I read this guy's books uh, anyway, because I just I felt confident that like with St. Thomas Aquinas, I can read, you know, I'm Catholic. Do I think right. that we should go to war for the Vatican? Definitely not. Do I like the Pope? <laughs> not at all. You know, I can handle it. I can trust myself to read stuff. So when I read his books and I read and one was like not about religion. I don't think I got to that one, but I was thunderstruck when I read his book called Straight Power Concepts. 
So people could say, well, he just lured you in with the first book so he could give you the second book, which was total BS, you know, but I don't, I don't know. He's very, a scholarly guy. And, and what it was, was what he said was that influence that Israel, for example, has in the U S is, is almost like they're paying for what they're going to get anyway. And that's where I feel like the individuals come in. So if you look at, I always think of it as a triangle, the UK, the US and Israel. And I've heard arguments of who's on top. I don't know. And the chances are, it's just an international power elite that doesn't really um, fall under those categories. More like but multiple heads of a snake, kind of? Like yeah, a serpent, yes. Sort of like a... I think someone's in charge though, and I just don't know who. And I would have gotcha. said the UK from the beginning. Okay. Um, but you don't know if like the Balfour Declaration was was really a, uh, a didn't spell it all out, you know, but that there was more of a triumph there or if the Balfour Declaration was about the UK needing an outpost to control oil. Mm. No, I don't know. And is the U.S. just the, a, 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 you know, a safety deposit box for the U.K.? Are we just, is our, is the Fed, you know, I read that the Fed started as a way to backstop European and U.K. central banks. So if we're just that, you know, who, who's on top? I really don't know. Or, and right. so when you've got like Israelis paying off uh, or influencing the government and, and holding court, like I want all the candidates to come to IPOC and I'm gonna like evaluate yeah. them. Is that symbolic? Is it real? Is it those guys who have a lot of money, like Adelson or whatever? Are they just looking out for themselves? They just want their casinos to keep going. Right. I really don't know. But this guy, Gregory Harms, would say that it's all about uh, controlling that power in the middle east and now that like the the oil maybe the oil the peak oil moves from the middle east and then you get like the the central asia there's some stuff from graham fuller who says we're gonna we used radical islam to control the middle east during when they were on top oil wise but now we need to move that into central asia because there's more and more resources being found there so Mm -hmm. is it straight power concepts and if it isn't, let me ask you this. If it isn't, what exactly is it? Is it Israel, the country? Is it um, the regime Jewish or- religion, which right. a lot of them are atheists? So what exactly is it that we're talking about? Or is it an international power elite? Like it kind of looks like to me. Right. With maybe a disproportionate influence coming out of Israel because it's a small place. You know, so if you yeah, had yeah. three, you know, if you had three people, if you had 300 people and 100 were from Israel, you know, you'd be like, yeah. that is really crooked. But if it's just UK, US and Israel for for those reasons, like that's where the power was. So but what do you think? Uh, well, actually, I was going to say that what I think when I look at it, but I also wanted to get your take on it out as well was I sort of see um to be honest, I kind of think of like the, the the mafia, so to speak, in the sense that there's different mob families and it, there's never one, f- like, if, for example, there'll be a, a current family in power for a couple years and then the power will slightly fluctuate. Then another family will be the, the higher up one. You know what I mean? So overall, I, I kind of look at it as different factions, but they're all overall, it's the same goal, control, resources, power, you name it. But I see a fluctuation. Would you ascribe that to the higher levels? I say that just, I ask that, sorry, because it's kind of like, at the end of the day, we're all human. We all, obviously some smarter than others, but we all think the the same generally. So would you say Israel uh, or Mossad, MI6, CIA, multiple, um, I guess we could say, functional but dysfunctional mob families metaphorically that are constantly not even just the intelligence but the countries yeah that's a great way of putting it now i think we we can um drill down a little bit Mm. that i think there are countries there are people there are their politics then there's this international power elite and some people within um, those countries are more or less, like to a greater or lesser degree, plugged into that. And then I think when you mentioned like MI6, Mossad, CIA, I think 
some of that, there is some specialization and outsourcing, like in the USSR, they did human experiments on it with psychology. I think in Israel, they do like, uh, they do the security stuff. You know, they use that oh, their oh. problems with terrorism as a launching off pants. Like we, we can't take any chances when it comes to security. So they were the first ones with like a locked cockpit and and right. really screen people at the airports. And then I think with China, they experiment on the surveillance and censorship stuff. Right. So you get away with what you can. And then in the end, they kind of pool their answers the way, like, I always think it's crazy that the U S allows defense contractors that it make all their money from the U S government, the government subsidizes their research basically. And then they can go sell this stuff to other countries who then later become our enemy. Well, why? Because we need the wars to justify the big government. So we, we want them to send it out. And so it's kind of a reverse thing to say, you, your buddy in China, yes, maybe there are good guys. Maybe Soleimani was like a true blue Iranian. And there's a bunch of traders in there who are horse trading with us to like, keep, keep the tensions going because that's how they get their power too. So right. yeah, there's gotta be human beings in the mix and, and they are going to do the things that they can maybe even just get away with according to their constitution or their own scruples or whatever. But there's a nut, there is a level where there, there is a family level, like you're saying it as a metaphor, but I think there's some reality to it. And I was yeah. reading something in a book about how Prince Philip, so some people speculate, and I would speculate that Princess Diana was killed. Oh, I would agree 100%. Yeah. Okay. So, and I read a quote that uh, insider said, now who knows if it's true? Meghan Markle said they're a bunch of racists. So maybe that is true. I don't know. But that Prince Philip said, she's going to have an Arab baby. That kid is going to be the half brother of the king. This is not going to work. So she's got to go. So whether she was pregnant or just engaged or whatever, it wasn't going to work. Wasn't she allegedly pregnant with uh, Al Fayed's son? Yeah, 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 yeah. Who's a Khashoggi, by the way. Oh, what? Yeah, his mother was a Khashoggi, if I'm not mistaken. Holy crap. Yeah. I didn't that know. Anand Khashoggi was a big arms dealer R- with oh, Iran. Man. Holy crap. I didn't even know that. Wow. That's yeah, incredible. so <sighs> I could see why they wouldn't want that. But that is the importance of the marriage, of the family relationship, which right. could be real. So when you when you look at something, for example, without jumping into it too much, but when you look at like 9-11, for example, in the sense of, you know, for some reason, the um, the Iraqi people and all that suffered way more than the Saudis did. And the Saudis clearly had far more intrinsic ties to Al Qaeda and all that. Clearly, there's it's, it's obviously on the basic level, it's money, it's the oil and all that. But why do you think at this point, like, for example, I, I'd like to get your perspective on there's a certain part of the country within America that really wants to move to like, you know, um, solar energy and things like this. And if that's the case, I understand that, you know, the, the rich neocons and the elites, they like their oil, they like their stuff. But in the case of, for example, um, Biden not um, going hard, going after, um, oh, what's his name? Um, the, the current Saudi prince for not for, for murdering the uh, the journalist there, Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah, yeah. What's your perspective on that? Like Biden, not necessarily Biden, but the, U, the U.S. government as a as a body, you know, kind of caving in to that. <sighs> Yeah, that gets into that weird, like, where, where do the factions begin and right. end? And where does the overarching that Jamal Khashoggi murder, supposedly, I, I have never felt I had any more of a handle on the basic facts of that than I do on whether Epstein is alive or dead. Mm. Like, I, yeah. I have never really understood why that became such a big deal and how, if the Saudis did it, how they could get away with it. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know. I just it's, don't it's know. Too, I guess the, the, da- the, the data points are not there for us publicly. To I just, that. I'm not even sure, you know, uh, it's like MH370 was this air plane yes. that went down over Indonesia. Yes, correct. Yeah. I, I, I think I cracked the code on that within the first week. I wrote an article about it. Well, I think it went could straight you, if down. It, if yeah. it's cool, could you explain? I'd love to hear your... your... Yeah, I think it, there were people who witnessed an explosion in the air and, and there were pictures of debris 
I, over the South China in the South China Sea, and over the, exactly one hour after that flight took off, and it was exactly where it disappeared. They told you it kept pinging for hours and hours. Mm -hmm. I actually looked at the Inmarsat records, and I could not find that. Like that was something I either concluded wasn't true, or I proved it wasn't true. But but what they what they did was they kept expanding their search area for thousands and thousands of miles and never, never searched directly that spot. It was a crazy thing. It was like a donut, an ever expanding donut. And that spot was exactly where all the evidence pointed to that thing just dropping out of the sky. And I think it probably blew up because of lithium ion batteries in the hold, which then became illegal, but for reasons probably of insurance or liability or whatever, it was to be a terrorist act was had much less repercussions for those responsible than if it had been uh, like an, a tort like negligence, which would have right. been those lithium ion batteries. So I think that was a real accident really happened. And then it was a problem because somebody could be held liable. So you got to solve that problem. But then you have an opportunity to like freak people out about, uh, you know, we need more control and you know what I mean? Just feed into a terrorist, whatever, you know? So Khashoggi, you know, who knows what happened? Like he got uh, like the, his slave maybe beat him to death. Like, I, you know what I mean? Like who knows uh, yeah, what, know what, what you, happened? Yeah. Maybe he's not even uh, dead. Like who knows what happened to that guy? Right. Um, but then they say, okay, well, let's just, you know, could even go, if you just wanted to speculate wildly, it could go like, we call out the, the Saudis or the Saudis are really bad guys when really, in fact, they're completely in bed with us from beginning to end. Obviously what they are because 15 Saudis did, did 9-11. So you don't even need to think it's an inside job. Just say, okay, well, the people who did it, are our allies who we continue to protect. So yeah, that's an inside yeah. job, even if Dick Cheney didn't do it. <laughs> you know, would like you, that. Would you that's... attribute it strictly to the oil because they're, they like such a business like relationship is there? Would you say it's strictly that or there's more underneath that? It's, it's so, it's so insanely sinister to think mm. that 9 11 was simply a, a monetary thing that's why it like you you, you almost want to believe yeah. it's a religious thing right but right. it doesn't like the official narrative doesn't hold water but it almost feels like a black mass you know like there's something crazy about it or even if it's not a black mass it's something that would really psychologically damage the american people and then i mean it, it is tantamount in my opinion to a, a government actor, Dick Cheney, whoever, deciding to draft thousands of people who are unwilling to fight in a war that is purely for land or taxes or oil or whatever, just, but many wars, all wars probably have been fought on those exact terms with the exact same thing. So if Dick Cheney is Machiavelli right. and the prince at the same time, you know, he says, don't be such a sissy. We kill people all the time. You know, I'm killing them because, you know, they, they, their lives don't even count right. and they're going to die anyway. You know, what, how else do you look at 18 year olds getting drafted and never coming back? Like how do, how does anyone ever make that decision? Well, if I could say very quickly, it's like when uh, Bill O'Reilly, I think it was the last time he did the Fox news Sunday, he interviewed Trump um, in 2017, or I think it was 17 or 18. But what I don't know if you saw this, but what happened was, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have when Bill O'Reilly, they were talking about Putin and Bill O'Reilly goes, yeah, but he goes, Mr. President, Putin's a killer. And then Trump goes, yeah, but he goes, you think we're so innocent. And then Bill O'Reilly, yes. he, he just went like, he had a, like a, an awkward, yes, uh, yes. know what to say. He was like, oh, like, you know, yes. <laughs> so when I look at that, I mean, I look at if it, um, I, I did want to cover Trump, if that's cool to transition yeah, to sure. that. But when when he says when Trump talks about like, um, you know, uh, being a disruptor and this and that, would you argue that you don't have to be against him nor for him to agree that he's a disruptor? Like they didn't want him there at all. The the neocons, the intel, the um, the military industrial complex, certain elements of the intelligence. Community. I, in my heart of hearts, I don't believe anyone can get there 
without having the buy-in. He didn't spend any money on his campaign. Jeff Zucker created him and at CNN made sure that everybody all the time said, oh no, not Trump. So that's very helpful. But the one thing that I can never get past with Trump is, and I absolutely talked about it in real time. I was all over the story immediately. It was so obvious. Trump in 2015 in the spring, maybe, of 2015 announces his campaign and he has that speech that has the immigrants are rapists, but also nice people thing, right? People get mad at me because I don't get the quote right, but I'm just putting it in your brain. That's what people heard him say, okay? Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck, this guy for real? And then one month later, and this is a girl who absolutely honed truth dar to where I could spot a false flag a mile away. And anyone that follows closely on the heels of a clear policy objective in support of it, that to me bears some serious scrutiny. So one month after he said that, which was shocking, it was like, how is he going to win any friends that way? Right. A woman named Kate Steinle was supposedly shot and killed in San Francisco by an illegal immigrant. And this was the thing they wanted to do. Kate's law about illegals and guns yeah. and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Right. I, I was like, wow, that is pretty convenient that his exact thing just played out. And boy, when I dug into, I, I watched that story for years. And when, uh, and I immediately discovered that the narrative they were laying out was not true, that never would have happened so the, this so-called illegal was mentally ill and he literally, I believe he kept crossing the border so he could go to jail because he was poor and he was drug addled and whatever. So he's in jail for five years for illegal crossing. ICE was about to deport him and the sheriff of San Francisco intervened on a drug charge that was no longer even against the law. It was a marijuana charge, demanded that ICE give this guy to him Then he released him and he was supposed to give him back to ice, but he didn't, he released him. The guy wakes up after taking a pill, finds a government issued, like a federal agent's gun in his lap, wrapped in a t-shirt, which he says just went off. He doesn't even know. And he was just really, um, there's an interview with him where he's clearly not mentally competent. And he had been adjudicated that way for a long time. He got off on the murder, which I, which I thought if there's any justice, he will, because this is mm-hmm. like not a real story. And he even got off on the, dr- on the gun charge. And, I, and the, they have a very unusual situation in San Francisco where the guy is, the public defender is an elected position. So the DA is usually an elected position, which is the prosecutor, but the right. public defender and that guy got him off. I couldn't believe it. I was in absolute shock. I used to write to their office, like, like give us information on this guy. I didn't think they would really fight for him, but they did. And after that, that, that guy, Jeff Adachi, the public defender, who was no friend of the establishment, he made a documentary. He He was an amateur filmmaker called Ricochet about that case. And you will never find that. And he died under mysterious circumstances, Jeff Adachi, right after that. Like I, so this was all the psyop I was watching unfold solely because it launched Trump's campaign. And that is the the number one thing. And, you know, you can't talk to everybody about that because most yeah. people don't even know what false flags are. Holy crap. Whoa. And I did. I just uh, found my episode on that. I used to I used to bring it to terrestrial radio. Oh it was it was so cool. <laughs> so wow. So my you just blew my mind there. First off, this is a fan, like you're 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 speaking golden words right now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I can send you the stuff. I had all the details and everything in my in sure, my shows. I, I'd love to. Sure. The, the the thing I wanted to add to that too was uh, I don't know if you followed. Um, you didn't necessarily need to follow it closely to know that it's not even a consp- like it is a conspiracy. But the whole thing with that 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 I believe it was a federal no. I'm not sure what type what type of judge, but she her family was shot at when she took on that Epstein case. Oh yeah, I and think Ep- wasn't her son actually killed? Was that yes? Epstein the thing? son was killed. The husband was injured. They yeah. shot at the house, and she I don't think she was there at the time that this yeah. happened. But do you have any like? Would you ascribe that same scenario to the the example or the sorry not the example the legitimate story that you just gave? Uh, like, would you say that these types of um, 
I don't want to say conspiracies because I mean, it's more mm-hmm. than that. You know what I mean? There's verification. Well, but- we all know that yeah. there have been political assassinations, that people have been scared to death. I think I would give two examples of people who were possibly killed in order to scare the main actor away. One is Harrison Deal in Georgia. Young guy went out with the current governor's son, uh, daughter. So Governor Kemp, who's overseeing a lot of election stuff in Georgia, this, the boyfriend of his daughter was killed in a really suspicious crash. And then one of the people on the investigative team committed suicide shortly thereafter. This was just over the past couple of months. That's Harrison Deal. And then I actually think Travis Kalanick of Uber was pushed out. They couldn't get him out, couldn't get him out, couldn't get him out. He was not cooperating with the government surveillance of users and drivers. And that's when his like, then everybody he used to be quirky Elon Muskie. And then all of a sudden he was just a big a-hole. So he wouldn't go. And then his mother died in a freak accident. And then he stepped down the next day. So like, these are things I do think happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I wanted to answer your question about Trump, by the way, which sure. is why would they allow Trump? Well, Trump did two things. One is he killed Ron Paul. So he killed that whole movement that they, they, he hijacked right. all of that energy and gutted it of all its ideology and made people in that group look crazy and stupid by, and I don't think they are, they're my people, you know, but now their conspiracy is Q instead of Kate Steinle, which is what it should have been. Got you. And, um, and they, they confuse anti left with, a libertarian ideology. So Ron Paul had a libertarian ideology and Trump just hates the other side. So he he kind of exploits that inherent belief that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So he did that and that was bad, I think. And then the other thing is he, he pulled the pendulum back so it may swing further. Whereas I think Hillary would have met a lot of resistance in trying to do the things that Trump kind of did by accident, huge deficits and totally no attention paid to the Bill of Rights. And also it gives, he's going to be, I think they're going to make an icon of Trump as the 21st century Hitler. Like if you vote populist or if you go out of the establishment or politics, bureaucracy, technocracy needs to be run by bureaucrats or people will die. Right. So I, with, with, I don't like yeah. talking like that because my mother loves Trump. My brother loves Trump. I get, I, I really think that people were embracing him for the same like revolutionary impulses that we do need to restore the constitution and the bill of rights. But I think they were cleverly hijacked. Got you. Okay. I see what, so in a form of, um, do you think Trump initially knew that going in? Because you, you had said that, and I agree with you, you can't really get in unless there's a buy-in, so to speak. Or do yes. you think that was kind of unraveled later on that he would be you know, presented as that kind? Because if I could say very yeah. quickly, Bernie Sanders, when he was running, in a lot of ways looked like a miniature Trump in yeah. the sense of the, the, the populism and all that. And he, Bernie Sanders looked like controlled opposition because yeah. they just needed someone to say like, hey, we got a third guy, a technically independent guy, but he's never going to really win. Okay. Dennis Kucinich was the Ron Paul of the left. Binkley okay. points out that Trump that, so I would say Bernie Sanders is, you know, Definitely controlled opposition, not as pure as Kucinich, but a kind of stepping stone from that. But that the real Trump of the left is AOC because she's so obnoxious. Uh, so if I could say quickly, did you follow the force to vote movement on that? No. No, she she had the chance to overthrow Pelosi and get $15 minimum wage with zero excuse, nothing. Yeah. She didn't do it. That's, didn't do it. that's what the Republicans did with Obamacare. Ted Cruz right. had this filibuster that everybody's making fun of him for. And it's like, if, if the Republicans without any Democrat votes would do what he just told them to do, right. Obamacare would have died right then. And I had hope for it. Same thing wow. with this electoral thing on January 6th. If the agents provocateur who were planted in those protests and allowed in through the holes had not disrupted it, we might actually be in engaging in a process to figure out what happened on November 20th. But 
those people went in and disrupted what would have been a three-day process of having to vet how those electors were certified in a few key states. And they didn't, they blew it up. So yeah, this is like proof of controlled opposition. What do I think is really Trump's game? I think Trump is, his real game is like his father made a lot of money building houses for using congressional funds like projects yeah. his right. sister's a federal judge he was in the casino business which is also a protected industry that you need connections he certainly yes. needed connections to get in and i think he he just simply he is he is pragmatic without the principles like he just i think he's he's everyone has the right to capitalize on the hand they were dealt, I think is his mind. I think that's what how he would define capitalism. I'm just capital capitalizing on a system. He used to say it about bankruptcy. I'm just capitalizing on the system that you set up. And sure. I should because I'm good. But sure. but so when he talked to Mika Brzezinski and Joe Scarborough, and I don't know if you heard this hidden audio that I think Harry Shearer revealed something like that, where they asked him at the break if he would was willing to field this question or that question. This is the people who are supposed to be his enemies. He said nothing hard. And so they didn't ask the question. This huh. was while he was campaigning. Yeah, because he used to call in often over to- uh, Yeah, he would call. Uh, and I mean, if they're going to control the message like that, so- they helped him do that, but I don't think he wasn't saying, all right, and then we'll do this and then we'll do that. And then people right. really fall for this one. He was just like, I'm a, I'm, I'm a guy you got to respect. And this is what I'm saying. And, and people love me. I mean, he says it all the time. You catch him on hidden audio saying people love me. See, that isn't that great. They love me. So he does. Right. I mean, I think he, he's playing the game and he's happy that he's, you know, he probably thinks he's doing the right thing. Like we started out with John Brennan probably thinks he's doing the right thing. Uh, okay, I see what you're saying, but, but but publicly, it's it's a it's just a it's a puppet show, sort of like that time when uh, Kamala Harris was giving fist bumps to the props to Lindsey Graham. Yes. When publicly, there was like they were just going at it. You know what I mean? But yes, when, when you look at someone like Bernie Sanders, um, not so much Bernie specifically, but sort of like the idea behind him. Do you think, aside from being controlled opposition, do you think he will always be or people like him down the road will always be kind of like the establishment's way of saying regardless left or right of saying look we got this third guy right over here you know he's all for the stuff that a lot of the younger people and things like this want um he doesn't have all the answers but he's got a you know a fair amount of like simple you know tax the wall street guys to pay for the medicare and this and that do you think he bernie's the kind of guy um where he's he's so close but he'll never really get there because he's controlled opposition but he's just yeah. there to give people hope like Yes, I, I think that, first of all, people like him are there. You can see on the left, he, he is not coming out strongly against intervention in foreign countries. Like he's right. really not doing that. And that's right. what he needs to do. That's the value of the left. Gotcha. So if they give up the only value they have, then, uh, then he has no value. And then the other stuff that he does appeal to people with the blah, blah, is, is, I mean, if you think of, let's say it's MMT they want, mon modern monetary theory, which right. AOC advocates. Let's just say he would accept that as, sure. a, so, as a compromise for his form of socialism. Sure. Nothing could be more regressive than printing money. Because, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because holders of assets go through the roof, and the wage earner takes a long time to recover. Right. So if, if when the market went from 28 to 19 and now is back at 32, do you, if you, if you lost your job when the market was at 19, did you just get it back for like 1.2 times what you were getting paid before? Mm. Unlikely. And as a matter of fact, if you did, it's probably because they didn't hire back the other guy who now has absolutely nothing. So the average wage is 0.6. Got you. Right. So sorry, go on. So yeah, I'm just saying like anytime you print money, you are benefiting the holders of assets, which is the true wealth. So income tax is not the true wealth because anybody, if you want to, you could just simply define wealth as wealthy as idle wealth. 
idle wealth. So you don't have to work. If you could right. literally define wealth as I don't have to work to support myself, then all income tax is on the not wealthy because uh, income tax is earned. Capital gains tax is something different, but I'm just saying, so they, they can say whatever they want. Yeah. But in the end, after Obama, we don't have fewer rich people and a level or wealth than we did in the 19th century. The 19th century had real prices going down and real wages going up. Right. And that is definitely not what's happened. And with Obama too, you not only over this time, you not only have all the money and power shooting to the top. Now you have a, a bias towards the political means of acquiring that money. So the political means is, so the economic means of, of creating value or acquiring wealth is that you create value and, and then you sell it and you get, the political means is to get it from that guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. so the political, so with Obama, when you start having regulations and then you notice there's this like outsized wealthy class, that's because the regulations kept the prices from normalizing. And that guy is a friend of Obama's. Ah, I see. so when you look at, for example, the fact that now don't quote me on this, you may have a, a the more accurate figure than I do, but I think it's something like 26% of all uh, cash has been print, printed that's circulating currently was printed in the last year and a half, something oh like that. Oh my this. God. Yeah. I, I haven't looked at that in a while. I do remember that like in the 2008 thing, yeah, ba the Fed balance sheet went from, I think it was 700,000 to four. I guess it was 700 billion to four. It can't have been 4 trillion. I guess it has to be 4 trillion. No, no, I think it was because I, I remember there was a thing that Steve Bannon said. He told a story about how they, um, the, the gang of eight in Congress went to, no, I forgot who it was, but they, they went to Bush and they said, uh, no, no, sorry, I forgot. Oh, the um, Goldman Sachs and the big bankers, they went oh, yes. to Bush and they said, we need X. I think it was something like a $2 trillion by the end of the day, or else the whole country's yeah. going to go like just yeah. kaput. And then Bush said, uh, you got to talk to uh, the gang of eight, the uh, Mitt McConnell, Pelosi, uh, Speaker Boehner at the time, because they were the ones that could authorize that, I if I'm not mistaken. Yes, I, I think that that stuff did happen. And when you looked back into it, you could see that they gave the European banks all that money. But the guy, Hank Paulson, was the guy who, I think he was the Treasury Secretary, he yeah. literally, it was like he filibustered to spook the market. Like he tried to spook, tried to spook, tried to spook, and he couldn't get the money from Congress. He couldn't, they had to let Lehman Brothers fail, even though Barclays, which ultimately bought up those assets, made the offer before Lehman Brothers failed and they would, oh. could not get approval. So that thing, that, and that's what I think about COVID too. It was, if you look at COVID policy, it is clear, or it looks like if you were just woke up or they, you got off, you know, the spaceship dropped you back down after a year running around up there, yeah. they, that you would say, they, and you said, look at, look at the policies that have been passed in Congress in the past year. You would see a, the response to a drastic fiscal crisis and not a health crisis. And I feel like they, mm -hmm. Hank Paulson did it then this time we did it uh, because they needed to shore up the rich again, or the, you know, I hate to say it like that, but zombie companies, like the status, the, the, the hierarchy as is, is right. what the system works to maintain. Like it's almost by definition has to be that way because the people right. in power are going to use the power to maintain their power. <laughs> and, you know, so truly, so nothing yeah. that Bernie Sanders has ever said or AOC has ever said makes me think that they will do anything but make that upper class smaller without actually making it less wealthy. So it will be fewer people, uh -huh. more control, but the but the money will be up there because just look at how the taxes are. The way New York and L.A. are going to be after this, the taxes are going to be, I mean, Everyone will have to give everything they have yeah. above their, if it were ever to be kind of paid with taxes. Otherwise, it's just inflation, which is the exact same thing in that your wages go down. Right. Your real wages are just going to go down to where when you actually go out and buy stuff, it's going to be 100% of what you just earned. So they don't have right. to do it through progressive taxation. They can do it through inflating away your wages but the bottom line is that inflation is going to go 
to bid up asset prices, which the holders of assets right now are going to be the only beneficiaries. Wow. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because I think you nailed that on the head when you said that they're not necessarily making the ones at the top less wealthier. They're just kind of like closing the, 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 the gap, so to speak, because when I look at AOC and I see, you know, when she tweets out all these, you know, great things and all that, or I look at Bernie Sanders, to be honest, more so AOC um, uh, plus three, Elon Omar, Ro Khanna, you know, the whole progressive squad. Yeah. But then when the time comes for an opportunity to metaphorically, you know, throw the punch, they never do. And I think it's because of fear of people like uh, Pelosi and, and Schumer and what have you, the ones that pretty much say not directly, but they subtly say like, listen, if you do this, you're not only going to rupture the whole system at the, the well-oiled machine, but we are going to destroy your lives and careers. Do you, do you subscribe to that? I think that what they probably, I, I think that it's even worse than that in that they are there strictly to mouth off. So just like right. Trump. So you think right. that stuff is getting done. You think this is a big threat and there is a big threat. There is a big threat. And the big threat is to our liberties and our opportunities, mm. but, but it's not because they're socialists, right? It's because they're, they're, they're the magicians. They're the distraction artists. That's the sleight of hand. It's the, um, Trump hates AOC and AOC hates Trump and they're going to scream at each other yeah. while, while everyone signs off on the COVID bill. Right. I mean, Trump signed off on $4 trillion worth of deficits. Right. I don't care if he calls Rosie O'Donnell fat. That doesn't make me feel better. <laughs> you <Right. know? laughs> it just doesn't help at all. Right, right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Well, I just wanted to say that I'm probably going to have to end it here, but it was a fantastic conversation. Please tell my, my audience where they can find you, your show, all of that. Yes, I've been really looking forward to talking to you ever since we were on Truth or Theory together. Thank you. Because they <laughs> said, they were like, this guy is a superstar. So I knew it would be fun and I, there was no chance that you couldn't keep up with me. And <laughs> I love that because you asked such great questions and you could have, I could have done the same thing to you and you would have blown my mind. So it is a tribute to you that you let me go on and on. But if people do want to hear what I do, my co-host Binkley and I, we do a daily show. So our show is called the Propaganda Report, but every day we do the drive time news blast where we try to do what you and I just did here, right, right. we try to do that with the daily news, like what's really going on because right. you need to know. And uh, we also have a Patreon, pa uh, patreon.com slash propaganda report where we do an extra 15 minutes of that a day. We get into a little more subtle issues and let our hair down. We let ourselves curse, but during the day, you know, the <laughs> free 30, we don't, people asked us not to, so we don't. And then we have cocktail parties, lots of fun. And Binkley really steals the show though, when in our Rockfin videos, because he goes through the um, Brookings Institution, the Council of Foreign Relations, the World Economic Forum, Rockefeller Foundation, Chatham House. He goes through all of these, like they do all their stuff. Like they put their Zoom calls and stuff on YouTube and yeah. they're just like literally conspiring to control the world. It's crazy. Wow. And he just blows my mind with this stuff every single time. So that's rockfin.com slash propaganda report. That's another subscription. Someday maybe we can get it all together, but we're still beholden to big tech. So we do we do what we can. That's the propaganda report. And I tweet like a mad woman at Monica Perez show. I, it makes me feel like a boomer because I know I should be like Insta or whatever. You're, you're little, you're little Insta. awesome, by the way. Oh, thank you. I really enjoy it. I get into trouble at home because I'm like under the covers <laughs> tweeting to like one in the morning. They're like, what? What's my husband? I was like, what's that? I was like, oh, I tweeted. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it made that little like bird sound, but I had right, to turn right. off all that stuff. <laughs> that well, is fun. Wow. So I, I just wanted to, to thank you so much for coming on and everyone, please check out Monica and her show, The Propaganda Report. Fantastic. As you guys could tell from this interview uh, or this conversation, rather, she's extremely smart and nothing gets by her. She catches everything. So I just wanted to, to say thank you again. Thank you so much, Dave. Let's do it again. Yes, for sure.